Well, hello there, Walnut Hill family. It's so good to be here in person with y'all, and Happy New Year to those of you guys here in Bethel, and for those of you in Waterbury, and New Milford, and Derby, and for those of you who are online today. If you don't know me, I'm Crystal Ellington. I'm the online campus pastor, and I'm so glad to be here with y'all this snowy morning in Connecticut. We made it. We're here. Happy 2024, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So speaking of 2024, how did your first week go? Was it all right? Have y'all made some New Year's resolutions? I know that there are different kinds of people that I've met since this New Year has started, and maybe you're one of them. There's kind of two dichotomies. There's like two ends of the spectrum. There's those who are really gung-ho about New Year's resolutions. They're ready. On December 31st, they have it all mapped out. They're ready to lose the weight, to read the books, to go on more vacations, to be with their families, to do all these things. And then there's this other group of people who are dead set against New Year's resolutions. They're like, it's just another day. It starts, yeah, it's the start of another year, but you know, I could start a new goal or a new thing whenever I want during the year. The day doesn't matter, right? There's, there's these two groups of people, and I don't know where you land. I'm kind of in the middle this year. I didn't really make too many resolutions, but I, I do care about the New Year. So that's where I am. I don't know where you stand, but regardless of where you stand, you know, I think after these past few years, we want this year to be really good. I think, I think we're due a good year and maybe even our best year ever. But, but what would it take? What would it take for this year to be our best year ever? Would it be, you know, security in your finances? You're looking at, you know, new jobs, vacations, new homes, new cars, that raise you've been looking for? Or would it take, you know, a solid health journey, you know, getting healthier, maybe losing a little bit of weight, maybe taking better care of yourself, exercising more? These are all good things, right? Or maybe it would be, you know, taking that time with your family, you know, resting, going, going on vacations with your friends, those kind of things. What would it take, really, to have your best year ever? What if I told you that those things I listed, while they're all really great and they would make you feel really good, that's not the one thing that you need to have your best year ever in 2024? What if I told you that? Would you believe me? There's actually one thing that you need in order to have your best year ever in 2024. What is it? Now, this is the question. Yeah, it's true. It's God. If, if this is a question that you have to, you know, consider. And as we have this question rolling around in our minds, we have to remember that there is one place that we need to go when we have questions about life. It's to God and to his word. And he has given us his word so that we can learn about him and know him. He's given us his word to advise us, to teach us, and to reach our hearts. So right now, we're going to turn to his word. We're going to turn to John chapter 10, verse 10. And I am going to read to you from the New King James Version for this morning. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, these are the words of Jesus. So that means we really need to be taking notice about what Jesus says. He says life more abundantly. He says the abundant life. So this is what it is. The abundant life will make 2024 your best year ever. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a little bit. Let me give you a little context about this passage. So Jesus was speaking to a group of people who had just witnessed or knew about this man who was healed from being born blind. He could see, and he was blind previously. And you know, as usual, when Jesus would you know, do these miracles, it caused a problem. It caused a stir among the people, the people who were around and the Pharisees. They really didn't like when Jesus was healing folks. And so Jesus led, was led to teach about the sheep the gate or the door, the doorkeeper, the thief and the shepherd and all these things. And, you know, people, as when Jesus usually spoke, he was, they were a little confused. So then Jesus was very direct with them. He revealed that he himself was the gate for the sheep. He said, if I back up a little bit to verse 9 in John chapter 10, he says, yes, I am the gate for the sheep. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, to give life, and that they may have it more abundantly. But what does that mean, life more abundantly? What does it mean to have a rich and satisfying life, according to Jesus? Well, for most of us Christians who live in the West, when we think of abundance, we're thinking of things. We're thinking of wealth and health and prospects and roles and positions and status. But really... Those things are determinants of success, at least the way culture looks at success in our day. But they're not necessarily the abundant life that Jesus is talking about. Actually, I know that's not what he was talking about. And so while we may have some of those things, that is not what Jesus was referring to when he said life more abundantly, a rich and satisfying life. 
The abundant life is a promise from Jesus that only he can fulfill. You can only experience abundant life when you have a relationship with Jesus. There's no way to abundant life without Jesus. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He came so that we could have life. That means without him, there is no life. He is the only way to this kind of abundant life that you want. And he puts our dependency on him for that abundant life that we're looking for a little bit differently in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is life. Jesus is calling us to come to him and to lay down all those things that we carry so that we can receive what he has for us. We must choose Jesus above all else. So I said the abundant life is a promise from Jesus that only he can give us. But it's also walking in a close relationship or intimacy with him. You go to him to receive life. He's the only place where we can go to receive the life that we all crave as human beings. We were made for and meant for this life, this close relationship with Jesus. How do I know? Well, even in the very beginning in Genesis we see that God had a relationship with Adam and Eve. He walked closely with them. He spoke with them. He interacted with them. He engaged with them. That is how I know that from the very beginning, that is what human beings were made for. And then we continue to see in Genesis as we go through the patriarchs, we go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see the prophets having intimate relationships with, with God. This is what we were made for. This is who we were created to be. In the abundant life, we have this opportunity to experience so many things. We can experience compassion and mercy from the God of compassion and mercy who was slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. We can experience rest from the God who will personally go with you and give you rest. He will give you peace and wholeness, completeness, health, safety, harmony, and prosperity. Peace with God and peace with the people around you. Peace that passes all understanding. We can experience joy from the God who shows us the way of life, granting us joy in his presence and pleasures at his hand forevermore. We can experience power and strength from the God who gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Those who trust in him will find new strength, soaring high on wings like eagles, running and not growing weary, walking and not fainting. We can experience righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit from the God who sets your life right and puts it together and completes it with his joy. We can experience hope from the God who is the source of hope who will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him and then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can experience fruit from the God who produces fruit in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we can experience freedom from the God who sets you free. Freedom from sin and shame and guilt. He sets you free to live in peace as you walk as a child of God with all the benefits. He, we have forgiveness. We have healing, redemption, love, and his tender mercy. All the things we need for a good life. These are the things we can experience in a relationship with God. All that to say, this abundant life, we get to experience the character of God, the hand of God in our lives because we walk closely with him. So like I said, the abundant life is a promise from Jesus that only he can fulfill. The abundant life is walking in a close relationship with Jesus. But then your next natural question probably is, how can I get it? What do I need to do? How do I need to live in order to have this abundant life? Well, what you must do is you must abide in Jesus. To live the abundant life, you must abide in Jesus. Let me read to you the words of Jesus from John chapter 15. The Bible says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now some of your translations may say, remain instead of abide. But the, the, the sentiment is the same. It's that committed, close relationship with Jesus that is required for you to experience, to have this kind of abundant life that we want. To abide means that your life is inextricably entwined with Jesus. Can you imagine a rope and you're entwined with Jesus? That's what it looks like to abide. Like this, this whole passage of scripture is talking about you cannot bear fruit without being connected to the vine. Like a branch cannot bear grapes without being connected to the main vine. You cannot bear fruit. You cannot really do anything that you want to do that is good for your life without Jesus. You must be as close to him as a branch is to a vine. But this passage of scripture in John 15 reveals three behaviors that you must have in order to live this abundant life, to do this abiding that I'm talking about. You have to surrender, you have to seek, and you have to submit. So to abide is to surrender to Jesus, and that means we acknowledge that we need him. We acknowledge that we were created by him and for him, and he knows exactly what we were created for. Let me read to you again from that passage, a little part, verses four and five. It says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So this choice right now we have is the choice to surrender our lives to Jesus. We have to openly acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. It says that in Romans chapter 10. This surrender is a requirement. You cannot receive the, the promise of abundant life from Jesus if you haven't surrendered your life to him. It's not enough to come to church to give, to, to listen to podcasts and to Christian messages and to listen to Christian music if you have not had this moment of belief and this declaration of your belief, of your faith in Jesus. So today is the day for those of you who have not surrendered your life to Jesus. Now is the time because if you desire for your 2024 to be the best year ever and you want to live this abundant life, you have to surrender your life to Jesus. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It gives you access to God in a way that you don't have it if you haven't surrendered your life to him. And this relationship, like I said, is one that we were created for. We were meant to walk with God in this way. So right now, I'm gonna, we're going to pray a prayer together, a prayer of surrender. And pray it online if you're at home, bow your heads. And this is an opportunity not for us to just surrender our lives for the first time, but for those of us who've been walking with Jesus a long time and we've slipped away, it's an opportunity for us to re-declare that he is Lord. So let's pray together. Jesus, you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords. We thank you so much for coming down as sacrifices for us, for being born to die. You were raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we could live in a restored relationship with you. Thank you so much. Lord, we are sorry for the ways that we have sinned, for the ways that we have gone our own way, for the ways that we've done our own thing, for the ways that we have ignored you. Lord, we are sorry. Please forgive us. Extend your forgiveness to us. And we know that you promise to extend that forgiveness to us when we repent, when we turn the other way. And now I say, Holy Spirit, come, fill us freshly today so that we can live for you in the way you desire for the way that you want us to live, the ways, the things that you want us to do, the things that you want us to say. Holy Spirit, we need you to do that in us. So be transforming us and filling us this day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So I said to abide is to surrender to Jesus, but to abide is also to seek Jesus wholeheartedly. Jesus says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. That means that we have to be about the business of looking for Jesus. And we can't just look for Jesus while we're watching television or Netflix or anything like that. We need to turn to our Bibles and look for him. We have this precious gift 
of the word of God. And it's the opportunity we have to learn who God is, to learn about his love and his promises. And there's a promise in there that says that when you seek Jesus with your whole heart, he will be found by you. Jesus is not hiding, friends. If you're serious about finding him, he will be found by you. You will find him. You will experience his love and his touch in your life. You will not be disappointed. I can promise you that. You can take that to the bank. So to abide is to surrender to Jesus. To, to abide is to seek Jesus. And to abide is to submit to Jesus. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what's the difference between surrender and submitting? Let me tell you. So surrender, you're saying Jesus is Lord. But when you submit, you're acting like Jesus is your Lord. You're giving him everything. You're giving him full control over your life because he is the Lord. He is the king. When you meet a king and they tell you to do something, you do it. And that is your, should be your relationship with Jesus. He is the king of kings. He says in John 15, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So submitting, like I said, is obeying. It's obedience. I know we don't really like that word sometimes. I tell my kids all the time, be obedient. But that's what submission is. We're listening for what Jesus has to say to us and responding to what he says when he says it. Not waiting, not hemming and hawing, not wondering if you have a better plan or you can come up with something different to do. No, it's doing what he says when he says to do it. You know, God can clearly see your hopes and ambitions, your plans that you have, and he knows, but he knows exactly what you were made for in your life. And this is the time where it comes in that pruning that's talked about in this John chapter 15 passage. He's pruning, he's taking away those things that you might think are good, and pulling them off you so that you could be more fruitful for his kingdom. You have to trust that God is working all things for your good because you were called according to his purpose. You gotta let those things go. And that might be hard. There might be something you are clinging to even now. I'm certain that there's somebody thinking about the thing that the Lord has asked them to let go, but they don't want to because they can't see the other side. But what you need to do now is to trust. To trust that God has good for you and he is good to you. And he will not ask you to do something that will not benefit you and his kingdom simultaneously. You know, pruning is about transformation. It's, it helps us to better understand how we can live in a close relationship with God. Let me read to you a passage from Romans chapter 12 talking about this transformation. The Apostle Paul says, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethics, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and in his purpose for you. So when you are pruned, you are being shaped more and more into the image of God. You're going from glory to glory. You sound and look and act less like the world we live in. That is what this transformation is talking about. This is what submitting looks like. You will not look the same. You will appear different. People may not recognize you as you change because you have submitted your life to Jesus. This fruit that you bear as a result of your pruning brings glory to God, and it brings joy to you. And this fruit is witness of your abundant life in Christ. So I've said the abundant life is a promise from Jesus that can only be fulfilled by him. The abundant life is walking in a close relationship with him. And to live this abundant life, you must abide. You must surrender. You must seek, and you must submit to Jesus. But there's a big but here. The abundant life is not a promise of a perfect life. The abundant life does not promise a perfect life. When you walk in close, intimate, intimate relationship with Jesus, it's not a guarantee that nothing will happen to you. Why? Because this world is fallen and broken. And Jesus says to us in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished by victory abiding. So Jesus is telling us 
that we have the hope of abundant life, walking in close relationship with him and experiencing the character and the hand of God in our lives despite the trouble we face in the world. And it's easy to look around and see the trouble. There's messes everywhere. There's messes at work. There's messes at home. There's messes in relationships. There's messes in our community and our country at large and pain. We have all these things in our lives that could make us believe that the abundant life is not for us. But this is a lie from the devil. The abundant life is a promise that Jesus wants all of us to attain, to, to live in and with. But sometimes we have to pursue, it, pursue Jesus a little bit more to get it. Sometimes you gotta look around at the mess and lift your head and focus your eyes and your heart on Jesus. You gotta pause and pray. Pause and ask the Lord to show you the abundant life in the moment you're in, the abundant life when you're sick, the abundant life when you're in pain, when the abundant life when you're facing betrayal, the abundant life when people are lying about you and being unkind to you. There is the abundant life there. Why? Because Jesus is there. He is with you. We have to choose to look for him in those moments and not get mired down by what we see around us. And this leads me to a warning that Jesus gives us about abundant life. I'm going to go back to John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So when Jesus spoke those words, he was speaking to the leaders, the religious leaders of the day. But I believe firmly that we can apply this to our lives today. The abundant life can be stolen. It can be killed and it can be destroyed. How? By, by us. When we choose to not pursue Jesus, when we are, have interference with our abiding in Jesus, when we are interrupted in our surrender, in our seeking, in our submission to Jesus, the world and life in general presents a multitude of distractions. It's really easy to get off your A game in your abiding with Jesus, but we have to choose to pursue him at all costs, no matter what is going on. Whatever difficulty you're facing, whatever pain, whatever mishap, whatever circumstance that is not what you want, this is the opportunity for you not to run from Jesus and to be focused down here, but to cling to Jesus, to turn to him, specifically say, Lord, this is messy. Help me in my mess. Make this mess my message. Turn this test into my testimony. This is what these opportunities for us are as we feel ourselves being mired down and weighed down by the weight of this world. In 1 Peter, we read a beautiful call for us as believers for what we need to do when we find ourselves in a mess. He says, cast all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on him, on Jesus. For he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. This is the opportunity we must take to silence the accuser. He's, he whispers to us so loudly, the abundant life isn't for you. God does not care about you. He doesn't love you. This is why all these things are happening. That is not the truth. We have to confound the truth, confound the lies with the truth of who God is. He is good to us. He loves us. These are all things that you can find as you pursue Jesus in his word. We have to pursue Jesus relentlessly. And I know it's our tendency when we face a storm in our lives to want to fix it, to find a solution ourselves, to not wait on the Lord. But I'm telling you today, you need to lift your eyes. Don't try to fix what's happening. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the one who has the solution. He is the one who has the wisdom and the strength and the power you need to get through because sometimes you're not gonna be able to go around it. You gotta go through it. The abundant life does not promise a perfect life, like I said, but it is a promise of the perfect one, his presence in our lives, Jesus, as we walk through our lives. So now let me, let me share an abundant life story with you. So what you may know is I recently had a baby. In August, I had my youngest girl. Her name is Lily Emmanuel. And that name was given to me by the Lord in prayer. And that's actually what he's done for me for all my kids. And I didn't know how important her name and the meaning behind it was going to be for me. Lily is from that passage in Matthew chapter 6. So let me read it to you, what it says, what the Lord says to us. He says, 
And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. God, with the name Lily, God was reminding me that he cared for me. And with the name Emmanuel, well, God is with me. And I didn't know how important that was going to be for me in my pregnancy. It was very difficult. I was sick, I would say 95% of the time. I had, was actually diagnosed with preeclampsia, so it was a very, very tough pregnancy. My doctor was actually very concerned for me. And so when I would have doctor's appointments, often she would send me to the hospital for monitoring. Now, for most people, going to the hospital brings up fear, and it did in me. And I, and I could say that I was genuinely afraid, but then I would pray, and I would seek the Lord. And then he would remind me, her name is Lily Emmanuel. I care about you, and I'm here with you. And even though nothing changed, I was still really sick, and they were worried about the baby, I had peace. So I would sit in a hospital bed being monitored, and I would listen to worship music, and I would pray, and I would read my Bible, and I would have peace. I would be pursuing Jesus and receiving that promise of abundant life, his peace in my life as I sat in the hospital bed. And it was a marvel to people who were around me. I was really sick, and lots of people, every person, medical staff who came and saw me was concerned, but I was peaceful, and they were wondering what was happening. There was a doctor who I would see regularly. She saw this big book that I had on the side of my bed. It was, it was one of my bigger Bibles. It was beautiful color on the outside. She's like, what is that? I was like, oh, that's my Bible. And she's looking at me like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this here? And I would be, have my eyes closed. People think I was sleeping and I would be praying. This, people would see the abundant life coming off of me, the peace of God as I sat in that hospital bed. And as I was not concerned because I knew, I knew in my heart of hearts that I would be okay and that Lily would be okay, and we both are. I'm here and she's here too. But the fact remains is that we have this abundant life. We have to pursue Jesus even when it's dark, even when it's scary, even when it's stormy. This is the choice we have to make. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus and not fixate on the problem. But this leads me to the last thing I want to say about abundant life. There is more to having the abundant life than having your best year ever. It's not just about you. And I learned that as I sat in a hospital bed and people were amazed and I had conversations about Jesus and faith while I'm being monitored. You're hearing the beeps, the beeps, and I'm talking about Jesus. It was just ridiculous but amazing at the same time. Your impact on the world is at stake with how you live and how you pursue Jesus and the abundant life that kind of pours off of you. Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We are called to reveal God to the world. We are called to be Jesus's ambassadors. And we do this by bearing the fruit of an abundant life. As we pursue Jesus, we receive that peace, that love, that joy that's associated with abundant life and people can see it and experience it through us. But let me put it this way. When we live the abundant life, it's what it looks like to arise and shine. We're still arising and shining, friends. So when you have an abundant life, you are awakened to the need of God in your life, to your need for his transformation in your heart and your mind, to your transformation of the way you do things. And then once you have been transformed and you are continuing to be transformed, then you can shine. You can reveal the glory of God, his magnificence, his worth, his loveliness, and his grandeur to the world that is very confused about who he is. And so, you know, today is just the beginning 
of this abundant life journey. We're gonna go continue on for seven more weeks and we're gonna look at new ways of living and new ways that we can share the abundant life. We're gonna consider how we can better manage our time and our talents, our relationships and our resources so that we can reflect the abundant life that we have and that we have gained as we pursue Jesus. So as I close, are you still interested in making 2024 your best year ever? If you are, amen, that's good. Choose the abundant life. Choose to pursue Jesus. Choose to walk in a close relationship with him. This will lead to your life being filled with joy and peace and rest and love and mercy and fruitfulness. So surrender your life to Jesus. Give him everything. All those things in your hand, let them be optional. Give him whatever he asks you for. Seek Jesus with fresh passion and excitement. You have to get to the point where you say, all I want is you, Jesus. No matter what I face, I'm gonna pursue you. Submit to him. Make him truly Lord over your life. Don't just say Jesus is Lord and do what you want. Make Jesus Lord by doing what he says, by walking in obedience. And then don't allow anything to steal or to kill or destroy the abundant life that he's given you. Make a plan, a commitment to pursue Jesus every day. I said commitment, I didn't say resolution for those of you who don't like resolutions. I said commitment, make a commitment to Jesus. Schedule time to pray, to read your word. And then pause during the day when you feel like you're getting weighed down by what's happening in your life, at your job, with your family. Pause and pray and receive the love and the peace that God has for you in his hand. You know, friends, my prayer today is that you would have the best year ever this 2024, but more importantly, my prayer is that you would choose to pursue Jesus and that you would receive the promise of abundant life